How is everybody this morning? Good. Good. We have the pet. I'm Doug Williams. I'm the sanctuary director here, and I just want to say thank you all for coming out to our first of maybe millions, I don't know, Purple Martin meetings. And uh, so, uh, Let's see, uh, I have some announcements here. Besides saying thank you, one of them is you should register over here. Uh, Donna Jones is gonna tape this so that we can make it available, and she's gonna, so if, if, you, uh, if you don't wanna be included in the tape, which you'll be famous, I'm just saying. <laughs> she's passing around, or there is a, there's a, a sheet that's going around that gives permission to for your image to be used. So if you're comfortable with that, sign away. And if you're not, don't sign away and we'll make sure that Donna doesn't make you live in infamy. Oh. Uh, also, uh, we saw our Purple Martin uh, Can you see houses out here in the field. Do you have a view over our heads? And uh, the first one went up on the lark 10 years ago and uh, was a gift that we thought, well, you know, we'll put it out there and see what happens. And the sparrows enjoyed it. <laughs> and then maybe five years ago, a Purple Martin at the end of the season actually landed on the box. So we were ecstatic, one that we were here and we saw that happen. And then uh, two is just the fact that, you know, there was there were Martins in the area. And uh, so uh, in following years, we had the, a Martin come back with a, a mate and they had uh, a few kids. And uh, now the colony has grown to the point where I think we had 40. Well, last year we pledged, we think 15, but we got, I moved here late in the game, so we didn't start from the beginning. And last, this season, 43. Wow. So at least we're going up. We have a lot, we had quite a, the first season I was here, four nesting pairs. Yes. Last year, we went up to, I think, nine. Mm -hmm. I have all that information on that. So. So, which is great, uh, and we're very excited, but we're also trying to figure out how we're going to raise the money to put in the next pole with the next boards on it. We have to raise this, what we need. And so, uh, we, we have set up an account to collect money from you people, so you can't leave until you give a donation. <laughs> uh, Jessica is holding up the box, yeah, so no, if you're inclined. And you want to see Martins do well here, please uh, help us support our little Martin colony. We appreciate it greatly. Um, we have, uh, I, 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 the, the day is going to, we're going to start out with John Atwood, who is the, uh, who is uh, my, my mentor. And I, uh, got me started in my conservation biology interest. And, uh, is now the grassland bird biologist. Actually, now I'm the director of bird conservation. <laughs> the director of bird <laughs> conservation. The title. There we go. We just call him Dr. John. But, but anyway, so uh, John, one of the things I think John's going to talk to us about a little bit, he's going to start the morning off uh, and just tell us a little bit about some of the work that Mass Audubon's been doing in bird conservation since the 70s. Uh, with the, with uh, a, a report that we've put out a couple of times called State of the Birds. And then I think, I'm hoping you're going to share a little bit of your own research with us too. So if you guys have questions in that regard, please feel free. After John's finished, we'll, we won't let him go. We'll have him here to give some, to answer some questions. We've got some questions for you. Uh, so, uh, and, then, and then we're going to jump into uh, some serious Purple Martin discussions, uh, the hows and whys, what works, and, and, uh, and what people are doing to get these birds in, and to encourage everybody, if you're not a Martin uh, parent now, to think about becoming one if you've got the right habitat. So, without any further ado, uh, Oh, uh, and by the way, the coffee is now ready. <laughs> probably, probably the most important. Uh, and there will be a break. We'll have a 15-minute break. Good. So you guys can <coughs> drink the coffee. So that's right. That's right. If I don't, I'm going to go back there while John's talking. Expel the coffee. So, so anyway, without any further ado, John, thank you very much for coming.
Um, I am going to uh, uh, be a bad speaker here and talk from back there in a moment, but I wanted to come up so I can fiddle with the computer and things like that. But I wanted to just thank you all for your, your uh, interest in Purple Martins and your support of Stony Brook, and, and uh, I'm excited to get to talk to you about some things here this morning that, that hopefully you'll find interesting. And certainly, um, when I realized I was going to be speaking to a bunch of Purple Martin experts, I, I realized, as I often do, that I'm sure I'm probably one of the most ignorant people in the room when it comes to Purple Martin biology. But I thought, well, these people are all going to know this species intimately from certain perspectives, and maybe I could bring some different perspectives this morning. And then yesterday afternoon I realized, you know, they probably have advertised this as a grassland birds talk. Oh God, now what do I do? <laughs> okay. Well, I can pull that one out. And so, so what I've done is kind of cobble together a bunch of information. You're guinea pigs in the sense of I've never given this presentation in its present configuration before. So we might be here till two o'clock. No, 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 no. <laughs> We'll just sort of see how this goes. Um, so, just to sort of start with something, I mean, these are grassland birds. I don't know, Doug, is that the lights? They kill the lights. Lights. Um, I'm not going to spend any time talking really about grassland birds except to, to note that they are in serious trouble. And you're going to see a whole bunch more maps like this in a minute, uh, not having to do with grassland birds, but other species. Um, basically, the take home message here to are to when you see uh, maps in this particular presentation that show lots of red, that's a bad sign. Those are areas where the species is, is significantly declining. And uh, you can see here that for those grassland birds, the dominant color of these maps is red. We don't like that at all. And NASA Audubon and a lot of other organizations are trying to figure out ways to solve this problem, looking at this from a uh, a much smaller scale than is continent wide. Here's a map that shows a bunch of square grid cells. These are grids that um, represent the Massachusetts Breeding Bird Atlas Survey Area. And some of you may have actually contributed to the Breeding Bird Atlas. Um, the idea here, which I'll go over in more detail in a minute, is that each one of those blocks was surveyed um, back in the period 1974 to 1979. And wherever birders found evidence of breeding, in this example, eastern meadowlarks, that was recorded as a, kind of an atlas block that the species was present in. And then in the second breeding bird atlas that we conducted, um, in 2007 to 2011, you can see that the picture has changed. Okay. So meadowlarks are very clearly a species that is in trouble, and in fact, just a week or so ago, uh, we formally petitioned the uh, state of Massachusetts to add this bird to their state endangered species list. And that's a, a review process that's just begun. We'll have to see what the outcome is. But this is something that you'll probably hear more about in the days to come. Um, one final thing, just a little plea for grassland birds support. Um, the problem with most of these species is that there's a, a difficult interaction between economics and biology. In New England especially, grasslands exist only where farmers farm hay, for the most part. There are some natural grasslands out in the vineyard, on Cape Cod, places like that. But for the most part, grasslands only are there courtesy of farmers. And in fact, if the farmers weren't there and those lands were allowed to just go through the process of natural succession, 
they're before us on those lands. So the only way to conserve grassland herd is to somehow keep the farmers happy, because they have to keep working, and they have to be in business to keep those fields open. But at the same time, their harvesting schedules often coincide pretty exactly with the bird nesting season. So therein lies the rub. Mm -hmm. And the, so one of the solutions that we're pushing hard, and I would invite you to go to this uh, website here, bobblingproject.com, um, the idea is we solicit support, financial support every year from conservation donors. We take that money and we make contracts with farmers mm -hmm. who are willing to say, you know, I'd be glad to delay my harvesting schedule for a few weeks, but unfortunately I can't afford to do that unless I've got some outside income that comes in. These people make their money through those that harvesting, right? And uh, they got to send their kids to college. They got to, you know, pay for tractors and trucks and things that make their farms work. And uh, so, so the the Bobwick project is kind of this creative idea. I'll probably talk to you about this for hours, but the idea is that we we identify farmers who are willing to say, you know. If you can give me a little extra money, I can basically afford not to cut my hay for an extra two or three weeks. And that two or three weeks buys the time that the bobblings need to finish fledging their young. So, a quick look at grassland birds. <laughs> and I thought, okay, well, this is where I started in preparing for this time. It's my own. I don't know a whole lot about uh, purple martins. In fact, I don't claim to know a whole lot about swallows in general, but I do know quite a bit about how different groups of birds and species are monitored um, in the state. And so I thought, well, let's just take a, a little bigger picture. Um, and I know nothing about what makes a good uh, purple martin nest box. I don't know anything about any of that. You guys do. Um, but I thought it might be interesting for this group to kind of spend some time hearing a little bit about the status of concert and conservation issues of these, uh, this group of species. And I thought I would, would proceed uh, with this big picture. And I intentionally used a slide here of purple martins and you know a saguaro cactus in Arizona just to remind you that there's bigger issues out there than what happens you know in this particular spot in Massachusetts. And so um, what I thought I would do is quickly walk through uh, three primary ways that, that ornithologists would evaluate the status of birds in North America. And some of you might be real familiar with some of these, some of you might not know anything about them at all. So um, the U.S. Geological Survey runs something called the Breeding Bird Survey. Um, Mass Audubon has conducted these breeding bird atlases that I sort of alluded to a minute ago. And then as a result of some of those breeding bird atlases, uh, we also produce documents uh, called State of the Birds that I'll tell you about. So let me just I'm going to do a quick overview of each of these three sources of information about swallows in North America. I'm going to run through all of them. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on any, but I want you to kind of get a feel for what we're working with when somebody says, just how are purple martins or pink swallows or barn swallows or northern rough wings, how are they doing? Are they declining? Increasing? What's going on? So, breeding bird survey to start with. Um, the idea of the breeding bird survey, this is one of the longest running citizen science programs in the world. Um, it consists of a, a number of survey routes, each about 25 miles long, um, with spots about a half a mile apart along each of these routes. And at each of these routes, 
the observers record during a three minute, three minute point count every bird that they see or hear within about a quarter mile radius. Surveys start about a half hour before dawn, uh, take about five hours to finish, and there's currently about 4,100 survey routes across the continental United States. These data are then analyzed by some of the most sophisticated biostatisticians in the U.S. biological services. Okay? So I'll show you information about that. Um, the breeding bird atlases that Doug mentioned, and I do too, uh, consists of a little bit different approach. We take the standard USGS topo map, we divide that to a graphic map into six blocks. Each one is approximately 10 square miles. And then those blocks are visited by atlases, which are typically uh, good, but not super sophisticated expert birders. Um, and those blocks get visited again and again and again over a period of a, in at least 20 hours. And each atlas effort consists of visits conducted over a several year period. A um, little bit of variation as we, we've worked into this from the mid-1970s to the more, most recent permutation in the uh, 2007 to 2011 period. So here's just an example, a single block and all of those blocks across the Commonwealth. And then the third source of information I'm going to talk a little bit about um, are, is the State of the Birds 3, which is this document here. And you can go to Mass Audubon's website and download a PDF file to get hold of this. I might have a few copies of this kicking around here at the sanctuary as well. Um, and this is something that's kind of different. It is focused entirely on, on the question of how we think distributions of Massachusetts bird populations might change in the future. So it's not reporting what people saw as they out, were out doing bird censuses or driving along doing point counts or anything like that. These are taking current information, and I'll tell you more details about this in a little bit, uh, taking current information about where we find birds and coupling that with the information that climate scientists tell us about what we think the future climate conditions will look like. And on the basis of that combination, then making some guesses. And they are guesses, they are educated guesses, but they are still guesses about what that might mean in the, in the future. So, but bottom line is we produce a series of maps that look something like that. Current conditions, hotter colors mean uh, more likely to occur. Uh, cooler colors mean less likely to occur. And so what you see is uh, on the left a map showing that, that at least in terms of the climatic conditions that we currently see up in birds, uh, virtually the entire state of Massachusetts is pretty likely to have oven birds encountered um, as you go wandering around looking for 2050, however, things might be a little different because the climate will be different in 2050. And so what we've done is we've created a bunch of these kinds of maps, and I'll show you those sorts of examples as well, specifically with regard as follows. So here's a quick run through on what these results currently look like. Um, a purple martin, okay, U.S. Uh, breeding bird survey. You'll see some largish areas of red. I'm not sure I can, there's a little laser pointer up here if you see up off the screen. So lots of red areas up in the northern tier of states. Patches of red in here, and patches of blue. Bluer areas where 
use, where the breeding bird survey suggests that marten populations are increasing in some areas out here on the west coast, Canada, areas in central or western Texas. If we break that down, if you look at where Massachusetts lies, right in that little continental scale, you see a solid blue area. So based on the breeding bird survey, here's the graph that shows, lost my point here. I'll put my finger in front of it. <laughs> the battery's not. Okay. There's a graph on the right. After a pound, the graph is going up. That, that's the reflection of the fact that the, on the map, that blue area is there for Massachusetts. So purple martins, based on the breeding bird survey, are doing quite fine in the state of Massachusetts. Thank you. Okay. Tree swallows. Lots of blue. But up in the northeast, the northern portion of the species range, um, and a few areas like in northern Utah, places like that, um, there's some pretty strong declines going on. And within Massachusetts, in fact, although you can't see it particularly well, you might get the idea that that's an orangish area that you see on the continental scale map. Um, and you see that reflected in the declining population line on the right. Barn swallows. Quite a bit of red in there. Um, some blue areas, good news spots where barn swallow populations seem to be increasing, but in Massachusetts, declining indicators. Um, bank swallows, probably one of the more habitat specialists of the swallow group. Uh, lots of red, especially in the eastern portion of the state and a pretty strong decline within the state of Massachusetts. Cliff swallows. Big area, it's sort of an interesting distribution there, isn't it? Big area of blue, so lots of areas where cliff swallows are doing well, but then some very substantial and contiguous areas of red where they're declining. And if you look over at the graph for the state of Massachusetts, you kind of have a oh, graph that's really different from all the others. On each one of these graphs, there's uh, a line, and then there's two lines above and below each line. So if you back up one to that, you see this a little better. So you'll see a declining line, and then it's bordered on two sides by a top and bottom. Those are what statisticians call confidence intervals. And so they're, and, and they're influenced by things like sample size and variation and things like that. So when we come to cliff swallows, we've got just weird confidence intervals going on. You know, it's showing a decline within the state of Massachusetts, but we're really kind of unsure about exactly where and how much that decline is there. That's over to Northern Ruffling Swallows. Uh, a generally increasing thing and a, a real hodgepodge of pattern across the state. Okay, that's the breeding bird survey. Let's see what the state of the birds documents within Massachusetts look like. So same set of species, we start with purple martins. And the maps that you see, which you can also go to the web and see these, these maps much better if you download the book just for state of the birds, and then you can select any particular species that might be of interest to you. And a page will pop up that will show uh, where in the first breeding bird uh, atlas the species was reported, and then in the second breeding bird atlas where the species was reported. The easier to understand, I hope, <laughs> uh, uh, information here are the graphs on the right. And what you see are, all in all of them are going to look somewhat like this. 
the first part of the graph, the upper part is for Atlas 1, the second is for Atlas 2. In Atlas 1, there were about 22 or so blocks where the species was confirmed as being present. Then there were some light green or medium green blocks where it was probably present. And then there were another few that were the light chartreuse colored green where it was possibly present. And so to read these graphs, what you do, and these are all straight off the web, so you can look at these at your heart's content if you like. Um, the top part says that, that because that dark green uh, portion of that bar shrinks from Atlas 1 to Atlas 2, that means that fewer blocks were found occupied in the second Atlas than in the first. Um, and in fact, cumulatively, there were fewer blocks where they were even seen as possibly present. So indication of a declining population. Here we go with tree swallows looking better, mm -hmm. right? More blocks where they were found in the second atlas than in the first. <coughs> Barn swallows, comparable, fairly stable, you might argue. Uh, bank swallows, a decline, so the dark green bar shrinks from atlas one to atlas two, that means fewer blocks where the species was encountered. Cliff swallows strong decline within the state of Massachusetts, uh, shrinking distribution. And rough-winged swallows and apparently increasing species. So it kind of bounces over around in different directions. And, and I think that's that's and it's maybe for some people kind of surprising because we kind of like to think of, of bird distributions in a simplistic sort of way. You open up your field guide and you see an area that says, oh, the species occurs here. Well, that's true, but it doesn't occur with equal abundance in each one of those indicated places on a range map. It's, it changes and it changes with time. Okay, the third piece here I want to spend a little bit more time on just because I think it's the most current and interesting for you. Um, these are the, this is the information that's included in the uh, new State of the Birds document. Um, and again, these are guesses about what the future might hold. Usually when you see um, maps that portray climate change, uh, you see stuff that looks like this. You see it usually at a global scale, um, and, and all of us probably cringe and think that looks terrible, and it probably is. But we, for, for conservation planning, at least at a scale that is local, regional or local, a map like that, what do we do with it? <laughs> And I say, well, the world's going to hell in a hand. <laughs> you know? But you know, what's it really play out to mean in terms of what we are thinking about facing in New England, in Massachusetts? And there's kind of three take-home lessons here that maybe if you don't think of anything else, this is an important slide to maybe take home. Um, three key themes. Climate's changing rapidly and the changes are accelerating. Okay? That's something all of you should think about when you walk out the door this afternoon. Uh, second thing, ecological processes are being upended, and that will have chaotic results. Third, as you start to pull, I don't know all of you, or maybe some of you have played Jenga, it's a fun game, right? Uh, you start pulling out these steps, sort of a stack of blocks, and you start pulling them out, pulling them out in the games to see who is the person that's going to screw up and pull the block that causes the whole tower to come crashing down. And, uh, and so, it's a good, a good example, though, to think in terms of ecology as we start to remove these blocks 
from our ecological systems, the whole tower becomes more and more vulnerable. So, so how do we affect climate? I'm going to just fly through these. You can, you can look at the uh, climate primer that's been written in the State of the Birds document that, that Audubon's uh, climate scientist, Dan Brown, um, has written. And this is good information if you're looking for sort of a description of why greenhouse gases are a problem. Um, How society controls those greenhouse gases, carbon emissions, will determine what the climate does in the future. So, you know, we've got different possible ways that society might respond. We don't know. That makes that's one of the big uncertainties. We simply don't know what's going to happen. If there's a medium control of greenhouse gases, then you know, by the year 2100, there will be a, a relatively intermediate amount of greenhouse uh, of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, and that will, in fact, then reduce how much actual uh, temperature gain and changes there are. At higher levels, there will be more. <laughs> and so, as we look at all those things, the more greenhouse gases we have, the more hot days there will be, the more increased levels of precip extreme precipitation levels there will be, and the more sea level will, will rise. All of that's just physics, just the way the world works. There's no way to get around it. But the point is that we choose, society chooses, where we fall on that carbon emissions graph on the left. We're the ones that choose that. And if you're like me, um, sometimes this kind of information might make you feel kind of like, oh, God, it's so overwhelming. What can I possibly do? I'm just going to go and be depressed. <laughs> and, uh, you know, this, um, this question of what can we do is one that, that as we wrote the State of the Birds document, this, this report, we were very cognizant of. We wanted this to be something that was, was kind of a, a call to action, if you will, of what people like you and me can do in the face of all of this all of this challenge. Now, I want to take a, a quick digression here and uh, just mention a little bit about our legacy. <coughs> now, these are some facts that might seem not to have a lot to do with climate change that they have. I would submit everything with what we can do. From 1901 to about 1910, millions, more than 37 million birds were killed for the millinery trade. And we know that because the millinery trade um, all worked through big uh, uh, companies in London that kept detailed, detailed records of how much they were selling these lots of feathers for. We know these numbers. <laughs> the feathers were worth billions of dollars, probably more by the weight, by weight than gold was at the time. This is remarkable. And those records just are the ones that were successfully sold. We're not talking about the collateral damages. You, know, you shoot an adult egret, you get some plumes off that egret, and the two or three young in the nest die and don't get counted. Those are the collateral damages. Or you shoot an egret 
and damn the shotgun, hell has destroyed the plumes. So it just lies in the mud. Can't sell that. Um, so there's just all kinds of nightmarish things that were going on. And this this one example. Um, three quarters of 700 hats that an ornithologist saw during two walks in 1886 along the streets of Manhattan had dead birds on them. And uh, that list there, which is a little hard for you to see, includes everything from green herons to white throated sparrows to snow buntings to Bohemian seated wax wings to scissor tail flycatchers to hummingbirds. These were decorative things on women's hats. <laughs> At Cape Cod, uh, good housekeeping wrote a report about this in 1886. And uh, that article, which was not exactly pleased with this scenario, wrote that 40,000 turns were killed in one census by a single agent of the hat trade. On Cobbs Island along the Virginia coast, an enterprising New York businesswoman bagged 40,000 seabirds. That would be mostly turns. Um, at 40 cents a piece, to meet the demands of a single actor. So, this is a terrible situation. It frankly makes me cry just to look at these pictures. And we're, we're faced though with, what can we do? Well, Here's the cool thing. Two people, two people, two Boston men that we think of as the founding mothers of Mass Audubon. Two people brought this slaughter to an end. Two people. So, and the um, Harriet Hemingway and Nana Hall uh, basically set off a revolt. They realized that conservation could be accomplished by working to your economics to change people's behavior. And I started having a key part. And the key part is that their friends were a part of it. Eventually they stopped. Uh, they got enough <coughs> support for women that had the buying those hats to stop buying And those, those efforts eventually turned into what we now know as the Migratory Bird Treaty Act. And as a result of that landmark legislation, market hunting was turned off. So, let's go back. Oops. What can we do? Well, this is the call to action. This is the stuff that you need to think about, right? Because you can do something too. Um, look at electricity production. Um, Mass Audubon supports a program called Meet the Switch. You can go to the website, do a search on Meet the Switch, and it will take you to a place where you can kind of put your money where your mouth is. If you want to 
power companies to use green electricity. You can just sign up, pay a little bit extra every month on your electric bill, and your power company will use green resources. Um, you should get energy audits. You should look at your transportation type costs, how you spend your gas. You should reduce the number of airplanes that you take. And if you take air flights, you should think about carbon offsets. These are all things that are, are definitely doable. What can we do? Eat less beef. What? I don't do with anybody. Well, it turns out that getting beef to the dinner table costs about five to ten times more greenhouse gas emissions. It requires about 28 times more land. It uses 11 times more water than protein sources like chicken. So maybe you can't eliminate beef entirely, but maybe you can cut that. And that's something to think about. My bird friendly coffee. Here's a couple of ones that might be surprising. Keep your cats at Well, this is kind of a, a frightening thought. Um, actually, the slide has been has now outdated because it only says one billion birds should be updated to two. So, outdoor cats. If you are looking for ways to try and conserve birds that we think are going to be stressed by the pressures of climate change, then get your cat inside. Here. Don't wonder about it. Just do it. Uh, reduce window cats. Another billion birds. So, you know, the, the birds that excuse me, the birds that we love are at risk. And if we can do anything to reduce those risks, we want to. Plant native shrubs, they really have insecticides in your yard. Mm -hmm. Support local land trusts. Support advocacy groups. All of these things are spelled out in some detail in this document, which I really encourage all of you to pick up. And okay, let's go back to some science. I don't get so sure about when I talk about science. Um, there are a lot of things that we expect climate change to do to our bird populations. It will influence timing, whether birds arrive before or after the insect flush in the springtime. It will influence things on how well birds survive from one year to the next, prey availability, all kinds of things. And what I wanted to do is tell you a little bit more about how we proceed in, in the science part of the state of the birds. <laughs> Um, so here's an example of how I did some of these analyses. Sorry. Slow. <laughs> so this is just an example. I should have probably pulled a purple mark, but I didn't. Sorry. I had the slide already. So this is a song for a familiar bird. Uh, all of you, or hopefully many of you, are familiar with eBird. Uh, it's a citizen science effort produced by the Cornell Lab of Ornithology. And they collect observations from around the world of people who see different species. So in the case of song sparrows, at the time I did this analysis, there were almost 4,500,000 eBird records in the data set. That's a lot of information, isn't it? 
of those, about 450,000 of them uh, were collected in June. In other words, were representative of breeding periods, song sparrows. So I took those records and sort of restricted it to a portion of, of uh, our world that's mostly in the eastern U.S. So here that you see that block, that's the uh, 600 or 66,000 dots that re represent where song sparrows had been reported on eBird during the month of June. So that was one of the pieces of data that we used. The second was we looked at within that area outlined by that green or by that red square, the area that had information uh, from some climatologists. And this information uh, sort of described for that region a number of variables that tell us about what temperature and precipitation patterns are like in that region. So hotter means hotter, bluer means cooler. This was the mean temperature of the warmest quarter of the year. There were 18 other variables like that that we used. If we look at that at a finer scale, Here's the mean temperature of the warmest quarter of the year. Let's make sure we understand what these maps do, because <laughs> they're really pretty remarkable if you think about it. These are not just maps that somebody with a watercolor brush has created. Okay. If we see that little square up here in the, the middle of um, let's look and see what that square consists of. It consists of a whole bunch of things called pixels. Each one of those pixels is about not quite a kilometer in size. It's about 0.7 by 0.7 kilometers. And miracles of computers, each one of those pixels has a number associated with it. In this case, the average temperature of the warmest quarter of the year. And so that pixel has a value. The pixel just to the right of it has another value. The pixel just to the right of that has another value. We took all of that information for all of these different variables, and we combined that with the eBird data. And we basically said, tell us what the sweep of climatic condi conditions are that would dictate where that particular species lives. We're looking just at climate. We're not looking at land use. You know? So it might be a, a Walmart parking lot. So it wouldn't affect, we wouldn't look at that. Just looking at climate. And this is the kind of thing that we got. So current distribution of song sparrows in the eastern US on the left. Future distribution, future by 2050 on the right. Mm. And you see, as you probably might expect with what you've read in the popular press, that the range is shifting northward along the Appalachian, song sparrows will probably persist because that will still continue to be somewhat cooler areas, but by and large it's moved northward. In the state of the birds document, we wanted to focus attention primarily on what was happening in the state of Massachusetts. So here's song sparrows in Massachusetts during current and future conditions. You see that, that uh, you know, right now, song sparrows are pretty widely distributed throughout the whole commonwealth. By 2050, though, there might be some areas where because of changing precipitation and temperature regimes, song sparrows are probably not going to be eliminated from those areas, but they are likely to have maybe some reduction in their distribution. There might not be quite as many. And we wanted to try and figure out how to quantify that, how to measure that. 
And so think back to that little map with all of those pixels. Okay. We asked the computer to tell us what the average pixel value was across all those hundreds of thousands of pixels for current and all ones per future. And so we came up with numbers. The average pixel current conditions was 0.513, future 0.492. This gave us then a way to compare what we were what we were running into. We could divide future by current, and we could come up with information that told us whether we expected that species to decline or stays mostly stable or increase. And so looking across the board, we ended up with maybe about of the 140 odd species that we analyzed, um, maybe about 80% were, uh, or about 60% actually were, were considered um, vulnerable by these criteria up here. So 143 species, 57% were likely highly vulnerable or highly vulnerable to climate change. So let's run through our small Here we are with the purple martins. Purple martins came out as a least vulnerable. So they're going to like the temperature in 2050 around here. Okay. I mean, warmer, probably more light, it's widely distributed. No real signal here that says, oh my gosh, purple martins are in trouble. Tree swallows, maybe not so much. They might be vulnerable <coughs> in the future. Uh, barn swallows may be vulnerable. Bank swallows may be vulnerable. Again, just because of temperature and precipitation, not having anything to do with land use and then uh, cliff swallows, maybe not so bad as far as climate is concerned. Um, bank or uh, rough wing swallows, maybe not so bad. So here's the three. Green bird survey, green bird atlases, state of the birds. And so what do we do here? Look at these. <laughs> I mean, this is, this is kind, of, kind of what scientists grapple with. You look at Massachusetts, based on the breeding bird survey, purple martins are increasing. If you look at Massachusetts, based on the breeding bird atlas information, purple martins are decreasing. If you look at purple martins based on the climate modeling, they're sort of stable. <laughs> you go, okay, what do we do with that? Does that mean that, that uh, there's nothing to worry about with purple martins in Massachusetts? Well, I don't know. You've got to remember what's going on with all these assessments. For one thing, recognize that all of this is focused on breeding birds, period. Right? Breeding all. And there's a map showing breeding distribution in North America based on breeding bird survey information. But obviously, that's not what your purple martins experience all year round, is it? Right? Because some of the time, they are en route to their wintering grounds down in South America. And if you look at that, you kind of realize that, gee, you know, maybe there are some things that are going on outside of the breeding range that might affect these populations. And you think, how do we get at that information? Well, one of the ways you might think of is through bird banding. And during that period of 1955 to 2000, um, something like 150,000 odd martins were banded probably mostly in boxes like you guys all support. You would think, well, that's a pretty large number. We ought to know a lot about where purple martins go. Okay. 
Well, it turns out that less than 1% of those parts actually get recovered away from the box that they got banded in. In other words, they just kind of, they go off into the big unknown. Uh, they come back the next year to that box. But in the meantime, Lord knows where they went based on those banding records. Well, it turns out that technology has kind of come to the rescue through a fancier way of banding. These are things called geolocators. They're little fancy items that you that the bird wears kind of as a backpack. And they have they have a a, a sensor on them that deter, detects sunrise and sunset. Okay. And they have a little computer chip in them that records for each day what the time of sunrise was and the time of sunset was. So somebody grabs a purple martin in June in a nest box in Massachusetts, and it takes off in August, I suppose, and heads off somewhere else. All that time, it's recording that information. Sunrise, sunset, sunrise, sunset. And if you know a lot more about this stuff than I do, <laughs> um, you can take that information and turn it into estimates of latitude and longitude. And then that bird comes back the following year, still carrying its little backpack with all that data recorded on it, and it pops back into the nest box, and the researcher grabs it and takes off the geolocator sticks it into a computer and you find out where that bird spent its, spent its last huh. number of days. So you can learn all kinds of cool stuff from this. Yeah, this I mean, these are just some gene quiz things. Travel between 180 and 250 miles per day. Uh, they can maybe get up to 300 miles per day. Include stopovers, those birds that jump across the Gulf usually do that in a non-stop flight of maybe 500 to 600 miles. Um, and we learned that they don't all take the same patterns, the same flight paths from day or from year to year or spring to spring. And remember, I want to pull us back to the conservation implications here. The conservation implications are that there are a lot of threats that birds might face when they leave our neck of the woods. Here's a, a picture of more purple martins than certainly I had ever seen in my life, and maybe you, but if you go down to Houston at the right time of year, the Houston Audubon Society takes people out to see these immense groups of purple martins, millions of birds. And you look at that and you think, well, how could a place that has millions of birds, how could these, this species ever be in trouble? Well, here's another look at Houston. During pretty much the exact time that the purple martins were all there a few months mm. ago. Mm. So they had day after day after day of torrential rain that had undoubtedly huge, sad human impacts, but also had the potential of really impacting this huge concentration of purple martins that had drained out of North America and were getting ready to head for South America. This sounds like climate change again, doesn't it? More intense storms. Or another idea, that goes even further, people had wondered whether uh, the birds in North America that were showing population declines might be wintering in different areas, possibly in portions of South America where they were encountering lots of nasty pesticides on agricultural fields. A very reasonable hypothesis. Well, this is the way science works. And the people studying this went to a bunch of locations indicated by those stars in the map in the middle of North America. Each one of those were colony sites, I'm sure very much like the ones you're all familiar with 
they, they have put a bunch of geolocators on those particular birds, thinking, well, let's find out whether these colonies that are showing declines are wintering in places with lots of bad pesticides. Right? And so they let them go, waited for them to come back, and darned if their hypothesis was just wrong. Because all of those birds, whether they came from, from southern Texas or British Columbia or Pennsylvania, all of those birds basically ended up in portions of the Amazon basin that was nothing but tropical, pretty much undisturbed forest. They weren't going down to, to agricultural areas in South America where they were using bad pesticides at all. So, the authors of this study concluded that if there are population declines in the northern tier of those colonies, they don't think it's due to pesticides in South America at all. They suggested that they think it's due to climate change. So it's a complicated picture. And uh, I think it's worth kind of, kind of thinking about that as we, we figure out what we can do in our neck of the woods to kind of help species like purple marks survive. So I've probably gone way over time, and uh, I apologize. I get choked up when I think about <laughs> conservation issues. Um, but uh, I'd be glad to answer any questions. So the Thanks, Purple Martins are heading down to Houston now. Is that part of them? Would they go somewhere else? I don't know. Would they know that? I don't think I know. Um, somebody probably knows. I know that many of the islands that were, were hit in the Caribbean may be not of relevance to Purple Martins, but to all sorts of other species. Um, some of the species that were, were hammered in, uh, say, the Virgin Islands, that area, um, they're just now trying to figure out what the status of some of those the warblers. They know that they had big, big hits on one of the big flamingo colonies down there. But they don't know whether those flamingos just moved to Cuba or whether they got killed outright. So there's a lot that people are, are still trying to figure out with all this stuff. That's a great question. I mean, the obvious question. <laughs> yeah. Sure, somebody, some, some purple martin lover in Houston probably knows the answer. Yeah. A question for you, Dr. Abbott. I was wondering um, who is putting on, what organization is putting on those little backpacks? The, um, the geolocator work um, was originally started by um, a professor named Bridget Stuchberry. And I believe that she has broadened her research to include a lot of collaborators. And, you know, there's nothing that really would prevent anybody from doing that other than the $400 or right. so that each one of those little tags costs and, and someone that has a banding permit authorized to, to put them on. But. Um, I'm sure that there are probably, uh, there, there's a team of about, and I think there are about six people as authors on that paper. So I imagine many of them are actually real biologists that hold a purple martin in the hand and put this, this on. And that's, a, that's become a, a hugely important uh, sort of tool for studying things like that. There's another another method that I'll just mention really fast that, that you might run into if you're out visiting the Purple Martins out on Plum Island, for instance. Mm -hmm. If you drive down the road out onto the refuge, at some point in there you see a, a, a tower that has looks like radio antennas. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, that is is part of a network of those towers, there might be 200 of them, scattered all along the coast from Nova Scotia down to sparsely down through the Caribbean. And those towers do something really cool. They receive information as birds carrying a different kind of tag fly by them. So if a bird carrying one of these little, little tags 
flies within a couple of miles of one of those towers, it records that information. And then at the end of the study, they can, now of course there's not a limitless number of those towers, there's a finite number of the towers. Um, but you know, those, that's a, a way to passively get that information. The tags are much smaller, they're much cheaper, they don't require that the bird be captured a second time. They just fly along, and if they go past the tower, it records that you know, Joe just flew past this spot. Mm -hmm. And they're using that kind of research tool for not just, I don't know if anybody's putting those on, on martins or not, but certainly terns and shorebirds are. And, and there's a woman at, at uh, UMass Amherst that's doing a lot of that work. Thank you. Yeah. Have you seen the information of the study that came out of Europe recently that shows a 30% loss of insect biomass? I just so these and uh, you know since these are insectivores, yep. uh, I would think that you know the belief was always with climate change it'd be the other way around with insects. You know they'd uh, it'd be more of them and they might get larger like prehistoric things. <laughs> um, but that. that Interesting. Yeah, I just saw that paper. I haven't read it yet. The, what he's referring to, or the, at least my knowledge of it, was this paper that just got publicized that people in Canada had done. Is, it, is that the one? I think it was Germany, actually. Oh, you're thinking Germany. Maybe I'm one. Maybe I'm thinking of a different one. But the idea was that, yes, you're absolutely right. Uh, I told you I hadn't read it. <laughs> you're absolutely right. It was a huge decline in insect population. Um, and uh, the, the question about, I started, when I started off putting this together, I thought, you know, I'm just going to do aerial insectivores. And aerial insectivores are a group that, on the big scale, is kind of a concern, problem, lots of declines but not uniform declines, interestingly. And if you start thinking, what qualifies even as an aerial insectivore? We've got some things that in our world certainly are declining. Whippoorwills, common nighthawks, chimney swifts, um, a lot of the flycatchers, but not all of the flycatchers, and some of the swallows, but not all of the swallows. <laughs> and frankly, my head started spinning when I, when I started off putting this talk together. All aerial insectivores, it was just out of the question. I couldn't deal with processing at all. But that's absolutely a, a concern that people are raising. Uh, well, it, it's just interesting. Locally, I've been uh, quacking or commenting to stuff for years now that I just don't see the insects I used to see in the garage. Life. Mm -hmm. yeah, you know, that's then, and with the corresponding frogs, toads, and things like that feeding on it. And then to have this come out, uh, and we, our tree swallows have disappeared for us, too. Know, mm -hmm. That might be one <laughs> But you know, the drought, I think Ray Marr will speak to this the drought last year, then yeah. impacted greatly the number of prey items. So if climate change means more drought, you know, that's going to affect the market. Well, the winter moths and the darn gypsy moths seem to be just fine. <laughs> no, we have gypsy moths being fed to our Martin's Jesse, you've got a question? Or? Yeah, um, on, on the map of uh, where the different purple martin populations were migrating to, yeah. I noticed they were all mostly in the same area except for the Vancouver bunch were going way yeah. down to the Vancouver bunch, coast. that was very good was, observation. Um, yeah. And I think that's a different subspecies, actually. Yeah. I think that they consider those yeah. ones up in the Pacific Northwest. Yeah. I don't remember what yeah. it is. But they they are really um, I think that is a good separation. Okay. That's what I mean. So, Madeline's daughter, who's an RN, was going to come in and take blood from everybody now. But instead, we thought we'd take a break. The coffee is finally ready. And so, uh, take a quick break while we set up Madeline's. But during your break, I put out, first of all, about window collisions, bird safe homes. I'm very concerned about the number of buildings, whether it's in Concord, I understand that the uh, the Rose Place is a glass in observation, um, but all our picture windows at home kill plenty of birds.
These you can take. I also brought some Purple Martin conservation magazines, and there's a number of articles about the tracking with the geolocators. Um, there's also some, that, they're not for taking, they're my only copy, right. but there's lots to look at through the break, so I'm gonna put them here. And when I came here to Stony Brook, I actually came here because my daughter had a birthday party here, and I saw the Martin house out here, but I saw so many sparrows. And I said, what's going on? And he said, well, we got, we think we had a Martin come by. And I said, well, I'm going to move to Massachusetts in a couple of years. And then I want to be your volunteer. And uh, that worked out. I actually did move. And um, I, I'm in Rehoboth, which is further south from here. But the Martin, the Martin enthusiasm around here has been great. I've really enjoyed it. But I wanted to give a little introduction about Martin. Not all of you know as, as much as some of the Martin landlords here. Um, this picture is one I took in Minnesota. This is a structure called the T14, um, which means it's got 14 rooms. It's designed by a fellow, an Amish fellow in the Midwest. You can see the Martins are on their porches. The males are kind of a glossy purple. The adult males are unmistakable. You might mistake them with a starling, but not really, uh, if you really know what you're looking at. The females have a more of a, we won't, I don't have time to get into their identification, but the adult females are definitely grayer, but you can still tell they're Martins. And they do pair up, although apparently there's some extra marital research. <laughs> but the, the, the important thing is they're colonial birds. And eastern Mississippi, they seem to be generally in uh, housing that is man-made. And that's, that requires a landlord. West of the Mississippi, they'll nest in cactus and snags out um, in Oregon. But I wanted to show you, this is one of the houses that I worked with in Minnesota. We generally had all 14 rooms filled with nesting pairs. This is, I don't know, think the, this is what not to do. This is down the road from me in Minnesota. This is a Martin house that became a total sparrow condo. <laughs> Obviously, it's in the brush, and the one thing you'll all learn is they are old. they need a big aerial space, probably about 60 feet from trees. You know, you can have a couple of trees. Apparently, in the southern U.S., they have more uh, maybe nests closer to the trees. But what you want to aim for are open areas, as Doug mentioned or John said. They are aerial insectivores. They fly around. So they want to come in, have a good landing, good clearance. Uh, this doesn't show up very well. Which of my, there, this is down the street from me in Rehoboth. I don't know if you can, well, this is more. There's a Martin house in there <laughs> on a pole. Uh, that's another thing, what not to do. These people have no Martins. And then, yeah, you can barely see it. It's white. It's a white. Yeah. It's what they call the old grandpa style. You see it's white. It's, under, it's up high, which is way close to trees. These people will never get Martin. Um, I just want to put a slide in. These are the bad guys. Now, if you live in Britain, you love them. They are native to Britain. The house or English sparrow on the right, that really isn't a sparrow, it's a finch. And the one on the left is the European uh, starling. Those are the ones you do not want. They are cavity nesters, highly competitive, aggressive birds. That is the bird you do not want. Now you'll have tree swallows occasionally you try to get into your Martin house, even a bluebird. But these are the ones that we'll talk about in our workshop. What do you do? I mean, there's certain cavities that you can prevent the starling from getting in. House sparrows are controversial, but they're the, really the bad guys. You know, you don't want. Okay, so I put down these slides. So this is. Um, well, we have, this is the good housing, and uh, Mary and uh, Ray will talk about the type of, these are artificial boards, plastic uh, super boards, or Troyer, we'll get this 
specifics. And I believe you took this picture. This is here. You can see how the martins like to perch and hang out. What is it? Dragonfly? Oh, we have a, a bad guy in the bad lower guy right corner. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they didn't do very well. In fact, the martins generally, when there were enough martins, got rid of them. But initially, when you start off with martins, uh, you don't want them around at all. In fact, you, you do want to get rid of them. Okay. So this is um, the Easton Country Club site, Easton Mass, where I've been helping out, and I was hoping Tom would be here. He's one of the uh, managers of the site. They have a wonderful wetland, great for dragonflies, the main source of food for, um, for martins. He has this old T14, he has gourds hanging down. The gourds all had martins we had. He had 87 eggs this summer, and he fled 61. Well, that sounds like a lot, but when you hear these other folks talk, you'll make us feel like, well, it's not too many, but it was much better than he had the year before, because he had never taken the housing down to check. And when I came and said, can I help you? He said, okay, and I said, well, we gotta check every week. It didn't work out because we had some other issues, but it's right on a golf course. Golf courses seem to be prime sites. I worry about the pesticides, but really they hunt up in the air. It should be fine, and I know Ray will talk about, and also Mary does a colony on, on golf courses. So he also has a board rack to the left of here, six, and they were all filled with martins this year. So I have, I feel like we're gonna be filled next year, but we've gotta be very careful monitoring. Uh, I hope you don't mind, Mary, but I, when I visited you a few years ago when I was still in Minnesota, I love the picture of the golf course. I mean, I was, yeah, there's the ocean over there. Yeah. <laughs> um, so this is in Mashpee. Mary will give you, and um, her helper will give you more details. So that's, that's a great, you know, notice they're not in the bushes. They're perfect, perfect habitat. This is the Stony Brook Martin team. Um, several of which are here. And those are two houses in the summer. The one on the left, it's uh, not the best house, but it does have long, deep rooms. And that is good in terms of safety from owls and predators. But we hope, eventually, to get another board rack. Because boards, especially certain type of boards, um, clearly uh, are better for the owls. But we did pretty well this year with that. And you can lower it. And that's the important part. Here is one of the volunteers, Kelly, who's out here. <laughs> Every week we would lower it and we could peek inside and keep that up. Get, find problems before they uh, get too big. This, there's our wooden house again. It was quite popular. We did better actually in this house than we did in the boards. But I think we'll have filled boards next year. This is uh, another photo that Karen, the volunteer, this is typically what you find, a lot of green leaves just when the eggs um, are bit going, about to be laid. They're white eggs, just like tree swallow eggs. I've seen broods as many seven to eight eggs. We, I think the most we had here were six. Uh, but that's it looking inside the cavity. It's not a complete clutch. This is, um, <laughs> I don't know. No, this is one of yours. Okay. Um, the newborn. They are rather ugly, but they're so ugly they're cute. And um, you can. We have a poster here that helps you age the, the nestlings. They pretty much hatch within a day or two of each other. This is uh, a 12-day-old Martin. I took a picture of once, so you can see they do take a long time. Bluebirds and other, some of the other sunbirds seem to fledge quicker. These guys take about 28 to 30 days. Here's a picture that Karen took about looking in. You can see they're really getting their, they've got their feathers. Um, and they're, they're a little crowded in there, but they do okay. And then uh, one of the advantages of being an educational area here is we can really inspire the younger people. And I think by being able to bring down the houses, they can peek in, we can talk about birds and what habitat they need, and of course they're our future. So a lot of Martin landlords tend to be retired older people, 
They're the ones that have the time. But we need to bring in the young generation. So I am going to segue over to Ray. Sorry, Ray, it's not the best picture. Um, I took a few pictures. Ray took me out one day. We had a great time. I couldn't believe how many sites he manages in Rhode Island and Southern um, Massachusetts. So we kept going to different, and I was snapping pictures, not the, you know, just from my phone. So if you want, this is Ray Marr. I'd like to thank Mass Audubon for allowing me to come here and to talk. Um, I do um, reach out to the community, uh, work with the PMCA, uh, Purple Mountain Conservation Association, and I try to mentor and educate the public because um, there's so much misinformation out there about uh, Purple Mountain, and um, I just want to get everybody like on the same page. I always reached out. There's a good friend of mine, Sue McGrath. She's a landlord from north of Boston, Mum Island. Me and her have been friends for many, many years, and Sometimes we don't always differ on how we manage the Martin, and you'll get that. Um, even people um, in Rhode Island, we have uh, about 15 to 20 uh, colonies, and um, I'll visit them, and I try to keep in touch with the people, and I try to tell them. I get information from the Purple Mountain Conservation. Um, I've been with them since, like, 1987. I've been a landlord since 1996, and I started off with one pier in northern Rhode Island, Smithfield. But in 2005, we had a rain event, and it lasted a week, and the colony was wiped out. And since then, that colony, I never, I tried to get it back after 10 years, I didn't get it back. And um, we, uh, I took a lot of the stuff that I had this private estate, and I moved it down to Barrington. And um, I manage over 100 pairs of purple mines in Barrington, and just over 100 in uh, Rehoboth, Crestwood Country Club, uh, the Jim Clark, the family there. Um, it's been, it's been a process. Um, Purple Mines, I'm so happy to see them here because this is a whole different community to reach out to and get hopefully other people involved about. We want to all stay on the same page. And um, I talk to people from New Brunswick, Canada, uh, Vermont. I spent almost four weeks in New Jersey visiting over 50 Martin colonies there many years ago. So I learned a lot. Um, and what the housing they like. And um, it was all about, around 2000, they, uh, PMCA did a, a scientific study, and they found that the Purple Mountain actually liked it, these big, large cavities. People in this country were putting out aluminum houses, which the cavity was too small, it was only four by four. So the mines weren't producing correctly, and they actually didn't like it, so they just avoided it. I had the small cavities for 10 years in Smithfield. I only had 10 nesting piers for 10 years. Um, I have old gourds now, and both communities, I have over 100 nesting pairs of purple mines. So, it's scientific. It's not just about being a landlord, it's about the scientific end of it, because you just don't want to put up a house and leave it there, you know, to get encrusted with these um, non-native birds, and it'll just rot away. Location is key, too. I work with a uh, two country clubs, I have a college site, a land trust site, and a few residents. Um, so, you know, it can happen. There's my, you know, if you go to a golf course, you can tell them, look, I want to do this conservation. Most of the time, they're very good with it, especially if you tell them about the person's phone. Change it to more than more than I think of a few more of your. Um, <laughs> Is this a good place? This is the site I took when you showed yeah. me This is a private estate here, but the man, he had those houses up. It must be 20 years he's had them. The Purple Mons have never nested in them. Those are the old Coates's houses, and he, I can't, his boards are to the left here, but because I'm going on his estate, I'm not gonna argue with him. He wants the aluminum houses, they're gonna stay. You know what I mean? There's nothing. So I don't argue that point with residents. He has um, 36 gourds. Do you have a picture of his gourds, Madeline? Uh, no, no, I don't think this, I did this time. This is, yeah. Well, he's got 36 gourds, and uh, maybe 34, 33 of them have purple mines. He fledges, fledges hundreds of purple mines, so. And isn't that on the river? Or yep, yep. Which it's a, river? It's Barrington River. It's, okay. why, it's a large, large water. Beautiful estate, um, but the reason how he got in touch with me was he was a member of the Golf Course Crestwood Country Club, and people are golfing there, and they're writing all over the internet, too, about how nice it is, and um, it's just public areas are so important to the because people go there, and they see them, and some of the members at Crestwood, I don't even know, they're from, you know, up in this area, and they go on 
buying the boards, putting them off. So public hearings are very, very important. It's private estates, if you put it on a private estate, nobody's gonna really see it. So you wanna really focus on an area that the public can see like this, or um, the Cranberry people a few years ago out in Middleborough, they, somebody had put up a board rack, but it was all wrong. But, you know, people saw it, people see it, and that's how you educate them, you know what I mean? I hate the idea that he has those aluminum houses, I tell everybody. Aluminum isn't the greatest because in the cold April when they return, they really, something like these thick gourds will keep them a little bit warmer than that, but a five day rain event doesn't matter, the whole colony could, would be wiped right out. The, the large volume of birds that I manage, even if we have a bad April, the migration continues and continues, so some of the older birds might get wiped out, but because there's so many being produced here in southern New England, there's no way they can get wiped out regionally. You know, I mean, there's just too many being produced. Um, they are they are nesting in northern Rhode Island. There's an area in Chipachet. That person tried for 20 years, but he has gourds and everything. Lo and behold, two years ago, he finally got them, so they're spreading. You have them here, if someone down the street, if there's a lodge, open meadow, or a park, I would definitely talk to someone, see if you can get gourds put up. These holes now, these are the Conley hole. These are the best on the market. Um, the Martins have no problems getting into these holes. I've, I've used a few different holes, and um, I've had problems with the birds entering, because after a while, when they first show, they're very thin and weak, but by the summer, by mid to, by the time the eggs go and hatch, they fatten up and they don't always, they can't always fit in the hole. These I've never ever had a problem with. Um, these are made, this was a modified super gourd, and I just bought this from the um, Troyers in Pennsylvania, they're Amish people. They're the ones that make these um, Troyer gourds is what they're called. These, every site I've ever gone to, these are what the purple mons actually prefer is um, this hole here, the Connolly hole. It's been modified a few different times. Uh, being a landlord too, you wanna be progressive and you wanna stay with the changes, you know what I mean? Because things are always changing and we're learning. A lot of the sites that I have, as you can see there, they always said the housing had to be within uh, 50 to 100 feet of your house and in Rhode Island we have them, um, you know, you walk up the door and the house is right there but they got the Martins. That's not really necessary or safe for them. You want a wide open location because once you get the volume of martins, the Cooper's hawk becomes a very attentive to your colony. <laughs> and um, you'll, you'll notice you'll be, they become your best friend, you know what I mean? Every morning, every night, I'm out there yelling, hollering, you know, trying to discourage them as much as I can because what happens is these purple martins become part of the family. They're your cat, they're your dog. You're gonna do everything in your power to protect and save them. Um, it's a funny relationship. It's like having a cat or a dog. <laughs> this is, um, this is like they say, you know, housing. These, you can see the housing here for the Purple Mines. This yeah. is a Barrington Lane Club. <laughs> this is a not fancy bay in the background, but there's no housing, none. And um, that's a site that I had a problem with the Cooper's Hall, but because it's in the wide open like that, um, the coop is, it's too open and there's too many uh, red-winged blackbirds, grackles. And I also encourage tree swallows, because tree swallows, be, they're little alamas, they're like a little chihuahua, so. <laughs> once, once they see these predators, and, um, they alarm the colony, because martins are very slow. Um, they're fast on the wing, but to take off, the coopers will dive at the colony and try to grab at them. Nine out of ten times they miss, but it's always, you know, you just don't know. You know, you're, oh, you know? But having the little tree swallows around is a great thing. And I've learned that in just a few years, just myself, you know? Um, let me see. Any questions? Where, where is that location? That's a Barrington Land Trust. That's the Narragansett Bay is in the background there. And um, most of the time they'll go right over the bay and feed on their insects. You'll see them hundreds of feet in the year because it's wide open. That's why it's so important. Golf courses, public parks, that's where and that will draw in other people and more people uh, become interested in them. And it'll just, in Rhode Island, uh, Barrington, when I first went there, I was at the Rhode Island Country Club. From there I went to RISD, from there I went to Dr. Mokler. From there, the Barrington Land Trust, and I just got another one in another five estate. So I have five locations in Barrington, two in Rehoboth, um, Crestwood, and the neighbor next door who golfed at Crestwood. 
he got into it and he has 72 boards. Crestwood Country Club has 72. And they just bought up another golf course and they're like, Ray, we want 12 boards at their new uh, Hazleton Golf Course in Rehoboth. So I would say, if I were gonna do it, again, I like golf courses. I like golf courses because they're wide open, they'll pay for everything. They might even give you a hundred dollars, you know what I mean, just to manage their, their birds. And it's good for them because, you know, golf courses, pesticides, so they definitely, there's a few other golf courses in Rhode Island that want me to work with them, but I told them, I, I promised everybody that I get to stay with the people that I'm with, I can't. If I can find other people that are interested, that's all good. But So how many hours a week during the season? Every day, every day before work, I start work at 8.30. Um, I'm up at like 5 a.m. in the morning and I go to Crestwood, Rhode Island Country Club, and a couple other, about three to four days during the week and on the weekends, I also have a site in Westerly, the Week of Power Golf Course, and I have 36 gourds, just pumps out large numbers of mines. I don't, I just stop in there, I take the golf cart to the Week of Power, to, to the site, 36 gourds, psh, 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 psh. <laughs> nothing, no time at all involved, and I usually go on a Saturday or Sunday afternoon, but uh, just large numbers. That's why coastal Connecticut, um, all of southern New England is, they even the private residents of Rhode Island, I've gone to them and tell them, look, you got this whole house, you need to... They do it. Amazingly, they did it. So Rhode Island, we have about 15 colonies. Connecticut is probably 40 to 50 colonies. Can you explain what you mean by manage that? Stuff? Manage? I don't know what you're talking about. Yeah, yeah. What I do is, just once a week I go there and just document what is... Because you, sometimes you'll find expired birds because um, it's a spring. Um, so you want to go there once a week um, just to see what's going on in that board. Is there a nest? Is there eggs? Once you have one egg, you document one egg. You know exactly when it's going to um, hatch, when it's going to fledge, okay? That's kind of important. You don't have to do it. We have people in Rhode Island that just put up the house and that's it. But I like to know how many, for all these people that I work with, they're, how many purple months they're producing. Because, uh, you know, they want to know, you know what I mean? So you go and you just document. Most of the season is done by mid to early July. They start nesting about June 1st, May 25, around that time. So around that time, I have everything up by April 1st. And by April 1st, um, I'll wait and just make sure everything's fine. And then about early May, that's when I uh, do my routine of going to the sites and monitoring what's going on. Mid to late May, that's when, when you start to see eggs. But it's not management. Once you have a colony and it's filled with all marms, they just do their own thing. It's, it's amazing, because the English sparrows were a problem, but once you have an established colony, um, it just pumps up baby marms, baby marms. <laughs> There's no work at all. The hottest job is <laughs> 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 What's the cost of a, a startup? Gourd yeah, yeah. colony. A rack and gourds is 450. 12 gourds. I don't I have like the land trust, they donated people donated some of the gourds, they <coughs> donated the racks. Um uh, I'll tell you, um Caratunk and Seacom, two per two I think three and three people donated money together and they bought the gourd rack for there. So <laughs> so basically, I have gourd racks that are 18 gourds. It's too heavy. You want 12. 12 is what you want. They prefer gourds over houses too. They like these gourds. I don't know what it is because I've had both, and I I had them in them houses. I got rid of them, and now I just use all gourds. You might see one gourd in a. Uh, at Crestwood, but I don't really, I mean, one aluminum house at Crestwood, but I really don't use that. Um, they fly, they like the gourds, it's funny. They're so smart, these birds. They really, and you now the public was misinformed, you know, ton of, all wrong information, you know. It's all location, location, too. Eastern Country Club, they're there, why? Because it's wide open. You may not be any for miles and miles around, but and they found Stony Brook, they, they found this location, yeah. you know? So it's a location. If you've got a, a swamp out there, tons of bugs, put it up here in the wide open, it's just a win-win situation. They're progressing, slowly but surely. In west of, west of Boston, it's only a matter of within a couple of years. This site, you want to build it up, you want to get as many as possible, because 
bad weather, it's due, it's gonna come, it's gonna affect these birds, and uh, Mary feeds the martin, so she's one of the few people, I think, in New England, she feeds the martin, yeah. so. Hopefully she'll well, what do you feed them? I mean, that's a good point, you brought <laughs> up a... Yeah, and Mary will talk, I mean. Oh, okay, I'm ahead of us. I just put it in the slideshow, but I think we'll have my flipper slide and show some Yeah, well, maybe when you, you're gonna talk again. I wanna make a couple points that I've come up with, my own, and I think you agree. You don't want your colony too big. I believe in having a lot of colonies scattered, because one big colony, the Coopers and the Greyhound, they're gonna find you. The other thing, I think 12 gores is ideal because when we check every five or seven days, you have to bring the house down and you, you wanna make sure to get out the dead birds. There are always gonna be some dead nestlings. Um, but by having 18 or 20 gourds up there, you're gonna keep the parents who are carrying their dragonflies away from feeding their young or incubating their eggs. So not a big colony is, I believe, more better for the Martins. And we'll get in, and Mary will give us some of her tips too. But mm. um. I can tell you two years ago, and um, in Rehoboth, I found 30 of them dead. It was because of a bad spell in April. So if they didn't have a larger colony, you know what I mean? It's like that. I, I already experienced that in Smithfield when we had bad weather. and. Um, I had a colony, it was about 20 birds, but they were all wiped right out. And like, I lost the sight, you know? And I, yeah. I tried for 10 years to get them back. It was a farm, 100 acres, on a lake. The owner gave me an aluminum house, and I added gourds there. But the elevation, 300 feet, that affects it. It's very cold. Oh. So you gotta look at that too, elevation. We're at 250. So, but getting those dead birds out was important. I know people who've done bluebird trails, you think, oh, I don't need to check them. You really do. You One do. or two dead nestlings in there or right. whatever. Okay. Right. So Inspired. that's why you monitor. You asked about management. Right. And the mites. And the mites. Yeah. Mites. You can change the nest and clean the nest. Yeah. Capped eggs. Yeah. You can uncap the egg, which when, a, when an egg hatches, sometimes the half shell from that hatched egg rolls onto an egg that hasn't hatched yet. That egg won't hatch if you don't see that it's capped with that shell. You can pull that off. That yeah. gives that egg a better chance of hatching. And um, there's, there's several reasons for monitoring. After that. Mary and um, Keely, when you give your presentation, um, we thought we'd open it up to like a 30 minute workshop or just best practices. You got experts here who really know about Martin. So if you're thinking of getting Martin or want to encourage your colony, questions uh, would be great. Yeah. Another thing is I encourage people, if you see somebody struggling, they put up a house somewhere and they're trying to get purple mines, to educate them. You know what I mean? I don't live up here, mm -hmm. but most of Rhode Island, the people, they know me. So I know that there's housing put up around here, but I'm, I don't know this area that well. If you know people, Encourage them. Tell them this is what you're going to do. You know, tell them, say, come to Stony Brook. Come look at the colony. You know what I mean? It's going to draw people here. It's going to help. It's so great. You know what I mean? And you can see right from the road. You don't even have to get on the property. You know what I mean? The more you have, you know, you, they're, they're vocal. So people will hear and see them. Have and you ever had vandalism? I work for a large park district. And we actually had to lock are from yep. being cranked down. We had teenagers on a Saturday night who had nothing better to do, and it was very, you know, throwing rocks or whatever. Yeah. So I don't know, you no. have that issue? Some of my sites, um, they are locked up. Um, yeah, you may some want to have I've had vandalism. Yeah. yeah. You just don't know. You wouldn't have it your own home, but in a public site, that's could yeah. be an issue. Um, yeah. So, so, yeah. oh, oh, to, uh, just to add to what we learned this summer, was that even in the middle of the summer there was a storm, it was even though it wasn't freezing, it was wet, and we had a one of those gourds yep. soaking, and the babies were soaking, and we thought that that might kill them, so we took it down, and we got, we cleaned it all out, and then we put all the grass in, we pulled the babies, put them back in, but we had to make sure that each gourd was put the exact way because if you don't, you said they don't know where the to go. The orientation. The orientation yeah. has to stay the same or the, the martins don't know where to go to find their babies. Right. So no matter what, if you take one down just to clean it or save whatever, you have to put it back exactly or they will not find their babies. Yeah. But we put it back, cleaned it, 
put it back up, the parents went right in to feed them. Yeah. And they, they, they fledged. That whole, the whole five of them fledged. It's always so. good to reach out. Like, I mentor, and so I help other people. And um, I helped, like, the Warren Land Trust. They were all new to this, and I helped them. And one girl was emailing me every day. Oh, my God, this is so cool. And some of the other people that were doing it. So you just got to reach out to somebody like Madeline up here. She can help you, and that's what I do. I just reach out and educate people because it's a it's a little different. It's not like tree swallows. Tree swallows are different from purple martins. They're not like bluebirds. Um, but once you get them, they come back, and their babies they come back, and your kind just grows and blossoms. So. Yep. Next, we have Jennifer. 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 Jennifer.
we, we don't ban the adults very often, though. Um, it's mostly the young that we're banning, but I still have two that we banned as nestlings in 2012, and they've returned every year. So it's pretty amazing. It, it, I probably miss a lot of the bands. I'm not there all the time, but I do go out and try to put a lot of effort and time into reading the bands to see which ones are coming back. Um, research shows, I, I know in, in John's um, talk, he said that 1% come back. It, it, years ago, it had been 10% back in the early 2000s, and it was this morning when I went on to, to research again, it's between 10 and 20% of the young will come back to their natal site, and the rest of them will return to within 100 to 200 miles of that area where they hatched from. So that's what we're finding with the, the newer colonies on the Cape that have been established. My, my Martins have shown up at these other sites. There's a new colony at Mass Audubon, uh, Long Pasture Sanctuary in Barnstable, and there's one at Wellfleet Bay Wildlife Sanctuary. I had encouraged both of those um, Mass Audubons to put, to put boards up, and they did, and they have attracted some Martins. And again, I, I tried to go around and, and read bands at other sites. It's um, difficult with time, but. How do you read them? Do you have a really I, great I, scope? I, I use my, I have a camera <laughs> and binoculars, but I have read them through scope. So if I go to the other sites, Wellfleet Bay and Long Pasture, uh, my Martins are very used to me. I, I do monitor almost every day, every other day. I'm there, I lower the gourds, I can look in. They, they're not phased by me whatsoever. They, they, most of them will fly out anyways as the gourds are being lowered if they're not already out. Some of them stay inside on the eggs, on the, on the um, young. Um, but even as they hatch, I'm there to monitor them. It, it's better with the gourds, you're just opening the cap and looking in, as opposed to the, the T14 or the, or the metal houses, you're, you're opening a whole side with availability to several different cavities, and that, I think, spooks them more when you have the whole, <laughs> whole side of a house opened up. With the gourds, it's easier because you're opening, opening the cap, taking it off and looking in. They look at you and put the cap back on. You see what you need to see in there, how many eggs, how many young. Um, but I do use my binoculars to, to initially see which ones are banded. I have a, a Canon 7D camera with a 100 to 400 millimeter lens and I take photos of the bands and then I download them and I can en enlarge them on the screen and read the numbers on them. But I can, sometimes I can see them even with my binoculars because I can get so close to my Martins at my sites. Like I said, they're so used to me coming and they're so used to people being around because they're on golf courses. The, the staff is always out there, the golfers are always out there. So they, they're used to humans. They, they actually like to be around humans. So the more people that are around them, the more comfortable they are. Um, they talked about lowering the gourds and keeping the adults away. When we're banding, we have a rack down for maybe, I don't know, an hour or so. The, the adults still go in and feed them when the racks, this, when the gourds are this low, they, they will still go in and feed the martin. So that, that's what I've found over the years. And, and pe people have different experiences at their, at their sites, but um, it is really neat to see them go in. And, and that's actually how we've captured a couple of adults. Right. <laughs> Mike will see one that'll run over and put his hand in front of walk him to come, getting out and then take it out and band it. Um, Mike's been banding for a number of years, and he loves to ban them, so um, I do have him to thank for helping me get involved with the banding. So your bands, you have one a fish and wildlife band, yep. the silver band, and then you now have a color band. Okay. Right, we started color banding in 2013. We have um, a red color band, I'll, I'll show you some pictures. It has MA on it from Massachusetts. Right. Um, Minnesota, we had MN. MN. Yep, um, I've encouraged Wellfleet yeah. Bay because they do have a banding staff there already. I'm hoping that they're going to start banding, color banding next year. We're, we're looking at, at blue for them to color band so that at least we can differentiate between the colors. Um, I've read a lot of bands from Connecticut Martins. Mm -hmm. I, I counted this morning in my records that I've had nine over the years that I've read bands for from Connecticut, but I have seen other colored bands that I haven't completely got the numbers <coughs> from. So I can't definitely say that they are from Connecticut. 
Connecticut uses a lot of different colors <laughs> and a lot of different color combinations. They'll have orange over yellow, the green over yellow, they have light blue, they have seen yellow with white. Um, you had a New Jersey model. I've had New Jersey, Virginia, and Ohio wow. as well. Wow. So that's one, one of my purposes today is to encourage you all if you do start any type of a colony, look and see if you have a pair, a pair of binoculars just to even see if any of them are banded. Um, once you start looking, you'll, you'll start to notice more. Um, Ray had one of my markings at his site years ago. Unfortunately, yep. it, it had expired, but... Um, yep. Is there some place where we, if we look at bands, where we report them? Or? Yeah, you can go to, um, I, I think it's just... USGS. Reportban.org or report reportban.org. I think it is. Or if you just type in report bird band, you can go on there. It'll take you through a process of how to how to report it, where you saw it, um, if you have the numbers, color banding, what leg it was on. All of that is on their website. Um, I do that when I get the out-of-state birds. I will go onto that site and, and report them. Uh, Mike enters the, the data that we have in in through through what he does. So that that information is there, um, but he he had one. It was at Rochester Colony. Yep. <coughs> we had one of my Martin Only yours there. Yeah. Okay. And so like I said, down in Wellfleet and and, and that, Barnstable. And that other new one. Mm -hmm. the, at that woman's house, don't you have another a third new colony out there? Remember that? Oh yeah, we didn't get to see if they had bands though. Uh, I'm sorry, I forgot about the Harwich. Colony. <laughs> That's newer this year, so I, I forgot about college. it. Is it um, in Baltimore, Baltimore? No, it's on a woman's property. She has a nice field setting. Um, she put up a gourd rat last year, and she did not attract any martins last year, but this year she had two pairs that um, pledged, I think, maybe six young. So in the in the ten years that I've, I've been doing this, the, the three new, at least three new colonies have come out of that. Um, there, there has been... I don't know when this colony started. It was a private country club in Falmouth. I'm aware of that there is a gourd rack there that they do have purple martins. And um, I do have some members from the Falmouth 300 committee here that got in touch with me this year. And they're looking to, to hopefully put up a gourd rack somewhere else in Falmouth. So we'll see if, if we can get another colony going there. Some people use a tape, either the John song or daytime chatter that I played here. Okay. If you're, some people go five years without Martin, did you believe it had that? You can use different tools to try to attract if the Martin's flying over the hey, there's a colony here. So you might want to talk to one of the people yeah. here that if you're hoping to be a Martin, don't get discouraged if you want to be a landlord. Mm -hmm. If you have the right habitat, huh? water helps. There's no doubt if you're near a wetland, that does increase your chances. But as Ray was saying, open, open is, the real estate is important. But now with all these colonies, people have a greater chance to attract them. But this is one of the tools, it's daytime shadow. <laughs> and it's easy bird song to learn. A lot of bird songs you might get defuddled by, but when they leave in August, the place sounds dead. <laughs> you know, you go into the draw. What? Do you have a good website to go to? I would go to purplemartin.org. That's the PMC, some of their literature. They have a lot how to attract martins. They have a sheet. Ten reasons why you don't have Martins. Um, if they have a forum, you can ask questions. Yeah. From people all over the country. That's how I got a lot of my tips earlier on, is just meeting the forum and what people all over the country were putting up and what not to put up. You know what I mean? It's just education. And if you're a landlord, it's something you should look at. That forum, the PMCA, it's so important. Plus, they have a scout arrival map, so in April you can go on and find out uh, where are the markets you do that coming up from the south and when they might be. I used to watch it in Minnesota, we were always kind of late, uh, but when Iowa got them, we knew they were coming. So that's a useful tool. There's a lot on that website. Delete bees. Delete what? Bees. bees. Honeybees. Uh, I don't know. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Jessica's experience was yeah. I 
I, yes, they did. They did. <laughs> no, I, uh, I'm a beekeeper, uh, and we had three hives out there last year, <coughs> right near the bluebird boxes as well as the purple martin boxes at night. Um, there was something definitely predating um, um, on the bees. Can't say whether or not it was purple martins. I haven't seen them in flight do that, but. Um, we have a lot of juice bottles in this team. Yes. And I forgot to mention, too, when I first found that colony at Willow Bend Country Club, I went on to the Purple Martin Conservation website and found Ray Marr <laughs> through their mentor program. So Ray was instrumental as well in helping me get started with the Martin. <laughs> watch form, I'd to get a pen. So, and I have to walk out to where my doors are. So I started just, I don't know, maybe because I have a teenage daughter that knows about phones and, and technology better than I do, I started keeping track of them through my notes on my phone. So it's much easier for me to just put the information in as I'm monitoring them. And then when I get home, I can transfer it onto the sheet. And then I also send it to Keelan. And she enters it into her amazing <laughs> program here that, that she'll show you some slides of. <laughs> What's the page? So, what, the one right, so yeah, and then okay. Mary uses her phone, but I use Excel for everything. So oh, our, yeah. our whole system, it's very rudimentary, but it gets the job done. Mm -hmm. So, But when I go out and do nest checks when Mary's away, um, I just print out a sheet and I, write, I handwrite. <laughs> That's just an example of what goes into the handwritten sheet. But this is our master worksheet. So it's, it's all in Excel, you know, down the left-hand side are all the boards. Um, Mary, based upon the nest checks, we get the total number of eggs laid, um, then how many are hatched. So that's why those nest checks are so important. So like day to day, we get the latest and greatest. And then at the very point just before banding, because we band all the birds, you know, we say how many are, are banded. And because you can lose some in the middle there. They can hatch and you know, they, they're not viable to ban. And then at the very end, we also do a check of how many are fledged. So then we have everything in this master table and then we can do all our cool statistics out of it. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, I also keep columns so that um, we sort of keep track, you know, at different points in the season. You see, we started banding in the 8th of July this year, you know, how, what the age was. So you can sort of see which, which uh, nestlings are viable for banding that particular day or that particular weekend. So I'm just showing a little piece of the spreadsheet because it's, you know. What are the negative values? Yeah. Uh, because it's too young. It hasn't, it's earlier. They haven't hatched yet. So yeah, that's why you would see negative numbers. Okay, so then we have a planning worksheet. So this is what we bring out to, to band. Um, we, we have a, this one's, uh, the date is August 11th, so it's at the end. But this one sort of shows us for each of the boards, you know, how many are their age today. So we know like in there in that good 12 to, you know, 15 or sometimes a little more, that those are good ones to ban. Sometimes we highlight them and that's our worksheet when we take out. And then here's our results. Um, as we ban the birds, we take results with uh, everything that we've done for them. So, you know, their band number, um, their area, S is, uh, what's S? Sex. Sex. So you is unknown. Oh, no, no. So most of the young are unknown, right? Right. So measure the wing, the tail, the weight, where they came from, you know, their site, the date we did it, and then sometimes you put other notes in there. So all that goes into the master spreadsheet as well. 
And then Mary keeps track of all her journeys, which you talked about before. Mm -hmm. So we have a we can so we haven't done a lot with this yet, but we can start doing things like percentage return. You know how many come back. I think I did something. It was like a, it was a pretty significant number that have come back at least one year. I, I think this year I totaled up a little over forty, um, but that would include the few that were at Barnstable. Um, and, and Wallfleet had, had, like I said, they've had one or two this year and last year that have shown up at Wallfleet. Um, Barnstable Long Pasture has had a few. So over 40, uh, most of them have returned to my sites, but a few have started to spread out a little bit. Okay. So this, again, it's just a little piece of the spreadsheet just to give you an idea. That, that's over 40 from this year. And yeah. in past years, others have returned but have not come back. That's pretty all right. Okay, and then a little bit of year-to-year -year stats. Again, a little rudimentary, but you can sort of see like our number of eggs laid, and it's the starting year is 2013 to 2017. We're sort of at capacity, so there's the, the, four, the 48 boards at the two sites, so we start to reach capacity. Um, so how many have fledged? So you know, great numbers from the beginning <laughs> of none, <laughs> all the way across. Uh, let's see, and then we broke it down by Willow Bend and then also by, um, you see there, by the two sites. And Willow Bend would have that a little bit of a decrease over the years. We mm -hmm. switched the housing from the T14, the 14 available compartments, and then went to the Gourds, which only had 12, but then we doubled that, so we have the, the 24 Gourds at both sites now. Mm -hmm. And then our success. So I started with 2015, because that's when we started to get really good numbers and had the same number of of houses, so you can see there, you know, how many of the, the goods were occupied, how many had somebody that fledged, and, um, you know, and then uh, for poll sites. So we just like to see these numbers go up. And then you see things like, I uh, started to do banks for board, those numbers go up, and, uh, our success goes up, 2017, 100%. <laughs> to the, the fledged 180, that's, that's actually really good. Um, and I, I don't know, I'll have to see in the next few years. When I first started, I was doing the once a week nest checks, which is what was recommended by the PMCA. Um, I started doing twice a week, three times a week, and like I said, now I try to go almost every day, like Ray, mm -hmm. I go before work, I have to be to work at 8, so <laughs> I, I hit both sites before 8 o'clock in the morning and speed my way to work. Sometimes I'll go late in the day. When, when, with the golf courses, you, you can only, I can only access early in the morning or later in the evening after the golfers are gone um, or before, before they start golfing, so it's a little bit of a disadvantage of, of a golf course colony, but if you're an early riser, you can get out there before those golfers and um, spend some time out there. And that's April and May, I think they start golfing a little bit later, and that's when I try to read the bands um, as the birds are returning in April. But um, yeah, it's, you don't want to disturb those golfers when they're out there. Or get my golf balls, which we have been very uh, <laughs> I know Mike's going to love this one. This is one of my all-time favorite photos, and we were trying to decide on a color for our band. Um, Mike, Mike and my guy put some wire together to look like a, a bird leg. That's a bird leg. <laughs> and he had some sample color bands. Um, he put that on top of his rack on his car, and we stood, um, I don't know how far away, quite a distance away, and I, I took a photo with my camera to see if we can, could, could read the numbers, um, and, and we easily could. These, these are great color bands. Um, we decided to go with red. Um, I think we've narrowed it down to, to those two colors, and, and like I said, uh, we're doing red. I'm hoping we'll, we'll do blue next year, but that's one of my favorite photos. <laughs> you think it would be of the Martins, but the, the wire leg is my favorite. Uh, these are those out-of-state um, bands. The one on the right is really interesting, and I, I know Mike would, would know this as well. It's a very, very old federal band that's from, uh, what, what, what would you say, that style that they use? They're, they're, they're different now, but this oh, is yeah. a bigger band with, with three different 
um, levels of, of writing. Well, it's actually a size too. It's one of the, yeah, it's, so it's people using the older ones. Yeah, uh, for whatever reason, I, they must have just had a, a, an extra one. I, I would have the year if I, if I could probably look it up when, when this bird was banded. Um, but the Ohio one, that one really threw me for a loop, and it took a long time to get the numbers off that and read. But um, I mean, if we go to the next slide, um, Connecticut, these are Connecticut bands. See, they have the, the yellow over green. There's a light blue. That, that light blue was a female. Um, showed up last year as a sub-adult at my willow bend site. And her, her nest failed. There was a little issue with the irrigation at Willow Bend, and the, the eggs ended up getting wet inside one of the gourds. Um, so her eggs never hatched, but she did come back this year, which was a surprise to me. Um, most of the time, if, if a, as far as I knew, I'm sure as far as Ray knows, if they fail at a site, they don't return to that particular site, but she did come back. So through banding records, we can, we can find out this information. Do you have bands printed up each year with a number on it or something? Uh, we got a thousand. Color bands. We got a thousand color, color bands. bands. By the, the federal government provides the, the, the solar fish and wildlife service bands. And there is a number that's, that specifies you on that band, or no? Uh, no, just through the records at the bird band laboratory. I mean, my name is an on the band. It's, you report the number to the fish and wildlife service, uh, and then they will, you know, through my records that I've submitted, figure out it's my, my band, which is actually American. So when you order a thousand, each one has a unique identifier yeah, on the band? Right. Okay, got it. Yeah, so. yeah the numbers on the, the band. It's like Social Security I think, number, um, you know, they're all just all different. I hope I put a good it's slide of a an actual color band where we can read the numbers yeah. on the, um, Yeah, the, the, the Massachusetts ones will be able to see. Not all of them, um, the, some of them just put those color markers. My red bands have members on them, and, and some others some others do on other bands for birds that are banded. Some of the color bands will have a number, but not all of them do. Mostly it's the federal number that people will read. They're so hard to read. Yeah, yeah. Hard to hard to the color, I have color had to try to read the federal bands, so there's more Connecticut, um, yellow over orange, orange over green. So they, they use a lot of different color combinations in Connecticut. Um, there we are at work. <laughs> They're very early in the morning. That one on the right there. It's There's a lot of dogs. Yes, mosquitoes. <laughs> That's why the woods are on. Mosquitoes. <laughs> so this is um, taking down the information there on the left after the birds are being um, weighed. Ashley on the right there is oh, measuring the tail on that particular young. That sounds great. Yes. Um, I think maybe you can see a little bit better on this bird on the right, um, somewhat significant. It's um, number 001. That's the first that color. The first it? color banded oh, purple marking. I, I I I don't know. I think I asked Sue. It, it, did you have a color band? We did color band the Plum Island uh -huh. for a few years, but we didn't use number band. Okay. We used just color band. Yeah. And we did something similar in making a, a wire leg as well because we were trying to test the disability. Uh, right. We wanted the most visible band. Yeah. And, you, have and uh, she wants. you know, you learn. You have to trial and error. Absolutely. Did we know moths are um, still learning over the years? Band at Plum Island, there was some difficulty uh, with not having a color banding permit. Uh, we were working under permit. someone else's do permit. Do you need and permission to do that? We didn't have uh, uh. permission to be color banding. Okay. So we kind of put that aside. I we wanted, haven't that's called an auxiliary band. We used to have to have special permission. Right. Yeah. But this is I, Yeah, North. I didn't know anything about uh, it at the time. So this is another person I was going to introduce from Newburyport Plum Island, longtime landlord of Purple Martins. I meant to introduce you earlier, and you brought along. This is Jane Sender. Jane. She's been working with me this season, and uh, I think she's addicted. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Very addictive. You know, I'll be going up before you go to work in the morning. Our, our Minnesota band had a letter J and then numbers. Right. We also were red with white digits. Yep. Um, so, One letter and three numbers. Right, and we did the same for ospreys and swans, so that's pretty much protocol from the fish and wildlife. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So some more of the weighing, measuring the wing, um, just the bands ready to, to be yeah. put on. <laughs> and this, <laughs> and another reason for nest 
checks, which I started um, to, to notice through banding, because we're actually physically taking the, the nestlings out. Um, I think in 2013, that was probably the first time we, we found an insect lodged inside a nestling's throat. And now more and more we're finding that. The one on the upper left, you really can't see it, but that dark spot is an insect in its throat. And it was constantly gagging, really. Um, what I, what I do, what I did with that one, I just, you know, carefully just put my pinky finger in with my fingernail and just kept trying to scrape it out to, to get it out. Um, you know, I don't know if it would have been okay, if it would have survived. Um, the one on the right, again, the, the mandibles on these insects, a lot of them are still being fed to the young live, so that their, their instinct is to, to try to get whatever is there and they just, attaching themselves to these nestlings. The two on the right did not make it, so that is a perfect example of that this does happen. They do choke. Um, I don't know how often, I don't know how much research been, has been done on this, but well, like I said, I've been finding it more and more over the years. Obviously, that dragonfly on the bottom right was a little bit too big for that guy. Um, I, I did pull it out, too, after, and, and it was just literally really attached in there and, and blood came out. Um, yeah, it wasn't a pretty sight, but there's, there's several more here. Um, these ones were all fine once the insects were removed, but that one on the bottom left, it, the, the mandibles are attached on, up on the top part of the tongue and then right underneath on the tongue of the, the nestling. So I, I think the parents took the, the, the mandibles off. And, Everything was okay with these ones, but that's just, you know, things you can look for when you're monitoring. So, I want to interject, I think when the parents are in that feeding frenzy, mm -hmm. there's so many mouths that they have to be in the, in the gourd or in the, mm -hmm. in the box cavity, um, they don't take the time to uh, kill it a little bit better or, right. or, or, you know, put enough pressure on it that they render it harmless yeah. to the young. Yeah, that, so they're, they're in a feeding frenzy when they do that. Right. And, they're um, absolutely not always dead. Right. <laughs> yeah. And then, uh, this might be one of the last, um, I guess, that's the one on the left was our, our first banded martin. You can see the MA on it. And then the one on the right, the significance of that one, that's Purple Martin, number 25013520. She's returned, she's the one, one of the ones that's returned for, for since 2012, and the other one is 25013151, I think, 18. Um, those two are returned um, every year. So it's been really neat to see them come back. I'll be looking for them again next year. I do, as someone mentioned earlier, I do do supplemental feeding. I could try to pull up some videos on my Flickr site if anybody wanted to see that, and I could talk about that if, if we have time, but we could, we could take some questions now. Um, I may have a question. So what is the life expectancy? I, I, on, on general, I think it is about five to six years. I, I remember reading, I think there was one 10-year-old ten, ten Martin that, that Yeah, it's weird. Had, I'd say five. Yeah, five, five, five six. Yeah, maximum. so about five to six. So, you know, whether or not these two will come back next year, we'll see. Any other questions? This migration is so costly. You're right. The chickadees that hang by your house maybe could be 11. I mean, some people. Uh, yeah. Uh, supplemental feeding, what do you do? Um, I have been doing crickets, and um, what we started doing was it was a store in, the, in a couple of towns over where I would go and purchase them live, <laughs> and we we use a plastic spoon, fling them up in the air, and and they catch them. They just think it, it's another insect flying by. Um, so mealworms doesn't work. It's I did fly. when I first started trying to supplemental feed. I did try mealworms, and I could see them watching them. And then you see the martins that go and watch it. The same with the crickets too, but they seem to take more to the crickets when I tried the, the bigger prey. Um, I did try male worms with the, you flipping with the runts. Too? You could use yeah. a wrist knot. Yeah. Wrist I know, I would put them uh, for runts. Sleep you know, those small yeah. ones, we'd give them a little extra in the nest. I gave oh, them some yes. male worms and they 
And, and I, now, like I said, I've been doing the, the supplemental feeding, I think I started back in maybe around 2009 or 10. I'd have to look that up, but I, I can literally just stand and hand toss them to the ones that come back each year. They hover in front of me, yeah. and I can just I can them up and they, they catch them. They know, even at times when, when the weather isn't great and they see me walking out, it's probably about a good quarter of a mile yeah. or more walk from where I come out of the woods across the, the green out to where my, my Martin colony is. They will see me and fly. You can see the colony starts. One, one spots me and they all start flying at me, hoping that I have food for them. But now, um, over the years, again, a learning process. I think we're all still learning new, 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 new procedures, um, what works best. Uh, you can order crickets online. I order them a thousand at a time. <laughs> I freeze them and then you can defrost them and still use them when, when you need to use them rather than having to run to the store and buy them when, when it's raining. Um, do you guys have a Facebook page or anything? Uh, well, I, do you want to try and go on the internet here? Can we do that? I can show you. know, us. some people in Minnesota, I don't know if it's down here, will feed scrambled eggs. I tried, I was going to say, I tried that this year for the Up first time. Up on platform. It does work. Yeah. I think they can go two days in cold, wet weather. The third day, you're going to start losing them. So right. you think it's snow legs up in the air too? Or? I know they put them in trade. These people have it down <laughs> like you. They come out of the door in the Martins. I think they train each other. They do have the, the platform. <coughs> they offer through Crickets the, the Martin here. Conservation website. They sell the, the, the feeding platforms. But I did try scrambled eggs for the first time this year, and. And the PMC and that did work for about. some of them. And then, as I was saying, with it, but they do hover in front of me. It was amazing that, and it was probably the older birds that are used to the crickets. <laughs> they would hover in front of me, and I'd toss up a scram like a little piece of scrambled egg, and they would just watch it. <laughs> I'd toss up another one, and they're like that, that isn't what we want. And the second I threw up a cricket, they knew, and they would catch it. <laughs> Um, some of them, I would see that they would catch the scrambled egg and spit it out. Um, but others did, again, this was the first time, the first year I tried scrambled eggs, so a few of them did take to it, a few of them did eat the scrambled eggs. So there, there is always something you can do, um, if you have the time, <laughs> to um, help feed them. Questions, Mary? So I'll try to log into my Twitter site. Question. Question. Yeah. Do you pre-treat the crickets to make them more nutritious? No, um, you really don't have to. Uh, defrost them. You can defrost them or freeze them again and use them. I know people do, but I, I don't like to do that. They're kind of gross at that point after already defrosting them once. Um, but they, they've, they've really helped out. I know. Um, this year there was a really bad cold spell for a week in, I think it was April, I forget what the week was, I, I told Ray about it. I lost 12, 12 Martins that week. Um, the temperatures overnight, um, I know Monday night were in the upper 30s. Um, they stayed in the 40s, low 50s, it's not good weather for insects to be flying around. So. Four out of those five days during that week, I did go out and supplemental feed, and I, I still ended up losing 12 birds. Three of them, either three or four of them were, were my birds that I had banded, and they were all um, second year birds, which I thought was interesting. Those, those were probably the birds that had not learned to supplemental feed when they came back last year as sub adults, and they returned this year. Um, maybe they would have learned to, to feed, but they hadn't at that point. So I, I, I wondered if the other ones that weren't banned and maybe they were all second year birds. I have kind of an obnoxious science question <laughs> that I, I don't throw out there just for you all to think about. Um, if you keep track of information like number of fledglings per year and you keep track of how many eggs were laid, how many gourds were present, if you aren't keeping track of exactly how much you're supplemental feeding, you can't end up comparing those numbers. <laughs> so just think about that. Add another column. 
Yeah, well, yeah, the skew, yeah, the yeah. affects you. Because you know, white hair, you feed a lot. Other hair, you don't feed a lot. That alone might explain your differences in fledging rates. So it's just something to think about because I, I realize how it must be fun to be a new part. I think it's so, yeah. <laughs> well, exactly. Same as, same as fostering. Uh, some people believe this when they go. 2014. This my bucket of crickets. <laughs> I think the teenagers would like to do this instead of the Cricket will follow the ground and then we go to try to find it. 
so we don't waste our crickets. But they didn't go to the ground, right? I found like, yeah, they, yeah, they, 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 they were calling out like the other seals. We went there, this crickets land on their heads. And well, you think their visual flash rate is? I had one down my shirt once. So they huh? just, wherever they land, they really land if they miss them. And then it eventually did go down to the ground and, and it picked the cricket up and flew off with it. And I've done the same with bluebirds too. Um, there was an adult male bluebird. The kingbird too. Well, I did one with the kingbird too, but <laughs> that's, a, that's a different story. The uh, adult male bluebird had some young, they had fledged, they were perched in a tree. And I was feeding martins and one of the crickets landed on the ground. The bluebird came down, picked it up and flew to the tree to feed its young. And I said, well, let me try this again. Six times in a row, it came back and picked the cricket up off the ground and went to feed it down in the tree. So it's not just purple martins that you can help by flinging crickets. You can help other species, other insectivores as well. Mealworms. A lot of people love uh, Karen and Juan who feed mealworms to bluebirds in the winter. In the wintertime. The dry ones, not live. The dry ones. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're going to try to wrap up by 12, but there'll be probably a lot of questions. One thing Karen, uh, the volunteer, was talking about, another good reason to monitor every week and know about eggs and when they're hatching is that when they get close to fledging, you want to be careful. You don't want to lower the house unless you can plug it up. You don't want them to come out too early. And uh, so you want to know at what point, and they don't all nest the same day. So you're going to have some that are going to nest early and be ready to fledge in July, others not till August. I know Ray has found that too. I mean, you found that? I mean, they're different age nestlings. Um, Except for this year. <laughs> I, yeah, this year was, was the weird. Martins were very late this year. They were, so they were late. Almost late. all of my colony oh. hatched with almost in a week. That makes it easier. Other. That, that was, yeah. That's never happened before. Yeah. Um, I do, and it's up to, up to the particular individual what you want to do with your colony, but I do still lower my, my gourds. Up until the day they fledged, I haven't had any issues. And I think, again, it's because of the newer housing. Yeah. I, you're not opening up a whole side, and they're all seeing you and, and getting spooked. I'm, I'm monitoring them and opening up the gourds almost every day. Even when I they're heading they, out? I mean, we've come and seen the babies reaching out of the hole, waiting for the next meal. They, they go back. Mine go back in. And I open it. They see. They, 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 it's almost as if they look at me every time. But I don't. I don't know that they would necessarily recognize me, but clearly the ones when I'm supplemental feeding recognize that I'm coming out to feed them. Um, but I haven't had a problem, and, and early on I was panicked about lowering them and banding some of them, knowing that there were other ones that were old enough in that range that could fledge too early. Um, somehow through banding we started slowly lowering them at older ages, and I haven't had any problems with them. I actually... <laughs> We can we can go into questions. I'll, I'm going to pull up the photo if I can find it. I have a picture of at least nine that I can count in this photo. The birds that had fledged after they fledged, they come back to the gourds at night. And, and I know Ray, this is one of Ray's favorites, going at sunset and just watching the whole colony come back and, and swirl around and then they all land on the gourds and the young awkwardly fly and try to land and then they, they go back into, not necessarily the gourd they hatched from though. So I, one morning I opened a gourd and there were at least nine fledglings roosting in the gourd together on top of each other. So I'll, I'll end that there and I'll, I'll pull up the picture and, and, and people can go around and um, ask questions too. Sue and Ray and, and others. Does anyone know about a pre-migratory roost in this area? Not yet. No. I, I think it's going to be in May, the Maurice River. You think so? Yeah. Alan Jackson told me there was 100,000 yeah. in a purple mile. Okay, yeah. wow. Couldn't believe the numbers. And I said, I'm doing the best yeah. we can in New England. Maurice yeah. River, which is on the so Bay Delaware Bayside, so, Southern Jersey. And then they work their way down. Yeah. Yeah. North and, uh, and west of Cape May. It's up, up, up the bay quite a ways. Yeah. No, not quite a ways. Not that big a state, but 
probably 30 miles up. And they have, you know, boat. They have boat rides right out into the river. That's a little slow. You know. It's not letting me space. In the Midwest, they seem to do it for about a week or two in cattail marshes, large, expensive, expansive marshes, and then they all somehow decide to leave. Yeah. That was thought to be the case in the Plum Island area as well. Uh, uh, Space bar. Fairly renowned birder by the name of Rick Kyle uh, told me that he thought there was a, a roost, a night roost, uh, in the Phragmites or the cattails in, uh, in the Rowley area. And I've never huh. seen it. I don't really know. I think we need a few drones out there to <laughs> figure it out. Yeah, because there's a lot of marsh you can't get to. Right. Sue, how many colonies in um, that Rye area in Hansha, Hinton, now? The uh, group that started in Seabrook uh, yep. has, I believe, two country clubs on board now. Wow. Uh, and um, nice. one other site. So I believe they have three sites. Good. Uh, one thing I didn't hear anyone mention is, if you're a Purple Mountain landlord, you have the patience of Job. <laughs> because it takes a few years for you to have success, and you can easily become frustrated and kind of abandon the project. But, you know, when you have success, it's just such great joy. Mm -hmm. But, um, you know, you, you have to be very patient in, in establishing a Purple Mountain colony. You know, it just doesn't uh, happen the first year. We're having year. trouble with the space bar <laughs> and the return key, so we Do they like, keep the greenheads down? They don't. I've not seen them eating greenheads. They're very high uh, aerial feeders, so they, they're very high up in the air. Greenheads are low. Greenheads? No justice, is there? No. <laughs> <laughs> so, have you heard anything from Pam Hunt? Because she said she's going to do something to increase the numbers there in the Pam shop. Pam has been working very closely with the Seabrook group. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know what happened up in Laconia. I have a feeling they may have lost that colony. But there is a colony in New Hampshire in the Wakefield area, I think, yeah. on a lake. Yeah, I've talked to her. Yeah. yeah. Wow. Yeah. Once you lose a colony, it's very hard to get it back. That's why you want to keep me. Well, that's why you need to be a diligent landlord yeah. and monitor and keep right. records. If you have an uh, owl or something, do a lot of predation, it could be the end of the colony. Right. And they will come back the next year. And a weather oh, event. They're very sensitive to weather. Yeah, the weather we can't put in right about. But hearing Dr. Atwood's comments about the weather. We are we're making it warmer. What's the small <laughs> thing you know? We know that you can put if you have a like open space in your bar, your yard could be small, but if you have a pile in the door, they'll nest in your yard, but they'll go feed in the next door, you know, area. Do you, do you, you want to find the lights? You don't want to spend 400 300 dollars putting it on the night. Because around here, they're in. You know what I mean? It's, it's going to take work. But you're not using the money side. So if you live yeah. nearby, yeah. there's a park. So you, know, you can get permission. Go to the park. Buy it over the area. That's yeah. really like where there's people. You know, yeah, a lake, you know, a river, no. I wouldn't, I wouldn't gamble with a, you know, social location because, like Mary and even Sue, we all have prime locations because we're at public parks or um, golf courses, so it's a win-win situation. You know what I mean? I don't own real estate, so I can't put up anything, you know, for the market. So I reached out to the golf courses and they trust. Those people and they're looking, they'll, they'll pay ago. for it. You know what I mean? The we'll beach trees anything. grow around it. And you know, yeah, it's just something you do in the summertime. It's a commitment, uh, yeah, but it can be done. You know? And they, they it, it makes them look good too that they're doing something environmental for, for their for their courses. Um, 
a lot of the country club superintendents, at least in, in my area, know each other. Um, right. I gave the, the Falma 300 committee a name of, of somebody in Falma at one of the golf courses that I got through one of the superintendents that I work with in Mashpee. He said, oh yeah, tell him to call Buddy and, and talk to him. So. They, they know each other, you know, they'll talk to each other. They're competitive, and, actually. The, yeah, they, the, two, the, two, the two superintendents, I, I tell them, you know, who has more Martins each year. Yeah, that's you what gotta, they sort of feed You have to take some of theirs and bring them over here. Uh, I may have missed this, but the, the gourds, are they configured in such a way that house sparrows cannot get in? No. Um, no. I have starling <laughs> resistant entrance holes. Um, for, for most of them, starlings cannot get into that particular style that's up front here. Sparrows will get into the house sparrows. Um, the house sparrows Sparrow. still can get in. So if you set up a, a, a what's, the, what's the term, a array of? Um, a, array. Array. a rack. A rack, a rack of gourds. Of gourds. Do you run in the wrong sort of place? Do you run the risk of just raising house right. sparrows? It, it depends. I, at the first few we'll years at Willow Bend, I, I had the wooden house and I had a pair of house sparrows around. I didn't notice that they did do any damage. Um, I, I tried trapping. I wasn't very good at it. Um, I, you know, I only have a certain amount of time that I, I can be there and you have to be there that whole time you have the trapping because you don't want to trap a, another bird. That, that is not a house sparrow. Um, but eventually, over the years, once my, both of my sites got to where they are, I, I very rarely see house sparrows around anymore. I'm not near a lot of structures. My, my gourds are near a pond and trees, not really house sparrow habitat. Um, I, I don't know if, if rays are closer to um, that type of habitat. I, I know Ray has to do quite yeah, a bit of traveling with house sparrows. I, yeah. <laughs> These gourds here they have like a little shutter, so if you have an English sparrow and he goes through the hole, it'll shutter, it'll close, and then you can just take a clear plastic bag over the hole and um, the sparrow will fly in the bag and just take them and you can release them four or five miles down the road. That's the newest technology. Or, <laughs> or, 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 or they are not, um, not protected. Four or five species, miles so. are right back. Are they? Yeah, that's not. Yeah. They're not native, yeah. unprotected, no. not protected. But they, species, they can be a problem. I have had them them if attack you want chickadees to, if you have the in heart. my or, yard in <laughs> my nest box. They, I, I found <laughs> dead adult chickadees. I, I, I know Mike does um, tree swallows, and, and he's had over the years seen damage that house oh. sparrows can do. So oh, it's, it's, kill the adults right in the they're box. Not, they're, they're a nasty bird. Yeah. 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 They peck the heads of the Peck their heads wide open and just nest on top of them. And kill them. Yeah. We, we, we have the same tons in the tree swallows. They were have to come in and lay those nests in the houses at the end of the dead. season. <laughs> the tree I'm sure I have some pictures of here with that as well on my Flickr site. I do recommend taking some. Yeah. Yeah. They're out my I, I get fleas. I, I don't know if, if Ray, if Ray has fleas. Do you, do you ever notice any fleas? Yeah. Uh, no fleas. Yeah. But I do get fleas. And the, and the issue I have with the fleas is I'll, I'll clean the gourds, but I've learned to, to leave them outside for several weeks after because you might not get that one flea egg, and that flea egg will still hatch after the fact, and there'll still be more fleas inside. So I cleaned my gourds probably. Uh, at least a month ago or more, and they're still sitting on my deck. Yeah. <laughs> you need to and then I will bring them and put them inside of my garage and store them for the for the winter. Someone I think mentioned a situation where things got wet inside. Yeah. Oh, I, that was from the irrigation at the the golf course. Um, uh, every so often, the sprinkler head readjusts. Uh -huh. and not not often, but I, I know this. Um, with, with the parks that I work for the town and they, they have to constantly go out and make sure that the sprinkler heads are, are situated properly for, for the irrigation. Is there a particular reason why you can't put drain holes in the bottom of the yeah. There are. Um, it just happened that the, the way that this, it, it must have literally gone right straight into the hole and got some wet and it was cold. And after that, they, they, there wasn't much of a chance they would have. Yeah, it could happen with rain in the direction where the wind is blowing the rain, but with the tunnel gourds, See, I think it's less of an issue so you for the rain to go in and through, the, through the entrance hole. I think it would have to be going, being, being blown at a really good angle to get into the tunnel gourd to get them wet. And the nests are so deep in, in 
further away from the tunnel where I don't think that so you're getting the, 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 the weather is an issue. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. so does yeah. the birds bring the